Hello, my lovely, morbid and awkward friends. How are you today? I hope you're having a lovely day, wherever you are, morning, day, noon, night, whatever it is. I hope you're having a lovely day, evening, all of the above. If you're new here, my name is Liz. I am your host here on Crete and Crime Time, and what I do is I talk about a true crime story, and I create a work of art at the same time. So if you're interested, subscribe, turn your notification bell on to all, and uh, today's tale is going to be a little bit different one. We're actually going to be talking about an unsolved case, and one that was just recently, the person was just recently identified, which was like mind-blowing. So, grab something to sip on. Honey, if you're watching this, you're welcome. <clears throat> that was his uh, little gift from me this year. So today's case we're going to be talking about is the Woodlawn Jane Doe. So what is notable to note about this, this case in particular is that literally she was just identified this year. For 45 years she was not identified. Um, she was her, okay. Her body remained unidentified for so long until the national center for missing and exploited children, Bode technology and Orthrum, hopefully Orthrum, 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 hopefully I said it right. Um, they're the ones that identified her and prior to her identification, she was known as the Woodlawn Jane Doe. Um, and now this is in reference to the area she was found in. That's why she was called the Woodlawn Jane Doe. And um, they don't know if it was one murderer, multiple murderers, nobody has been apprehended. And she was a beautiful woman. Like when they showed her actual picture, absolutely beautiful. Like you would think that people would have recognized like similarities in getting ahead of myself so let's talk about this case so she was discovered on the morning of september 12 1976 at 10 20 in the morning um the body all it says is that the body of a 15 to 30 year old woman had been found now she was found partially wrapped in a white sheet she had been beaten strangled and raped uh, the rape had caused bleeding, which seeped into her clothing. And she likely died in a different location and was transported there. In where she was transported to was the side of Dogwood Road and it's near the back gate of a cemetery. It's possible that a Ford Ecoline van can be linked to this case because one was seen near this location. Um about an hour before the body was found. So it's possible that that van was the van that transported her body there and the perpetrators obviously left the scene. Um, she wore a turquoise colored stone bead tied uh, like rawhide string necklace and also in her possession was two brass keys uh, one, they believe, was for her house, and the other one was for the night latch. Um, they were found attached by a safety pin in one of her pockets of her tan yellow jeans. Ah, sorry. She also wore a white and tan shirt, a white bra, distinctive knee socks, and uh, a multi with multicolored stripes. So she obviously had nice clothing she had beautiful jewelry on. This is what baffles me as to why she wasn't identified faster and her loved ones didn't come forward. But she also wore light tan moccasins uh, that had twine laces and rubber soles. They were, they were found near her body, so they weren't on her feet. Um, they're believed to be worn by her. There was other pieces of cloth uh, found on the body, but they weren't like... Uh, part of her clothing, so just different pieces of cloth. Um, also, two bandanas and a bag of grass seeds were found over her face, so they covered her face. Um, 
they had been fastened behind her neck in a square knot. So it literally covered her face. Um, one bandana was blue and the other one was white. Uh, blue and white and the other one was orange and white. Sorry about that. And um, the orange and white bandana was found to have holes cut in it to fit the locations of her eyes and her nose. So what I think is... What I think happened is they put that, whoever took her, they put the handkerchief on her face, the first one, and then they ended up putting the grass seed on her face and then the other handkerchief on top of it. Besides having the bag on her face, they also found grass seeds in her throat. Now this is determined uh, her cause of death which was ligature strangulation. So, I mean, she has them tied around her face and her neck, plus having grass seed in her, in her airway. So it's obviously she was swallowing this grass seed. Um, and the bag itself, the bag of grass seed, had the words Farm Bureau Association Grass Seed of Lexington, Mass. Her hands were bound behind her back, so she couldn't get away. And it was done so in a way of like a bondage, um, a bondage style of being bound because they were high quality knots. So it's somebody that was very skilled with doing knots with rope that bound her. When they did a talk screen, they found a very large amount of the drug clorazepam in her system, which if you don't know, it's a sedative. They found quantities of it in her stomach. So they believe this was used to sedate her, but also clorazepam is also a schizophrenic drug. So it's used to treat schizophrenia. Um, and it led them to a theory that it linked the victim or who's responsible for her murder to a mental institution. And also the sheet that was wrapped around her body was consistent to those that are provided to help inpatient institutes. So this sheet is from somewhere that does intake for our patients. So now we have two things that tie to an institution of sorts. We have clorazepam and we have that sheet. I personally believe it was somebody within the mental health field in a institution near this area that did this. Also, there could be another theory that it possibly could have been a inmate of an institution. So with the Ford Ecoline van, that's generally what they used to move patients if they had to, if they have to like go anywhere or if they had to ship them to another institution. Um, and they generally have them on campus at these institutions. So it could, could have either been a worker or an inmate that broke out, stole the van and They, if they were taking clorazepam and the um, person that was administering the medication didn't see them take it, they swiped it. It's another possibility that they just had their clorazepam, force fed it to her, and, you know, after they bound her and <sighs> you get the gist. That's what I think in my head a possibility of two possibilities of what could have happened. So upon examination of her, uh, she weighed between 149 pounds and 159 pounds, and she was between 5'6 and 5'9. <clears throat> Sorry about that. She was determined to have O positive blood, um, and there was also evidence that she had been treated by a dentist because she had fillings in the remaining five molars, she had already had three of them removed. Because of the amount and quality of her dental care, they 
believe that she didn't come from a background of poverty and one of her other teeth were was noticeably crooked um she also had a very poorly tattooed pair of letters probably initials found on her left arm they believe it's either jp ss or jb or liter or a similar litter combination um she had her ears pierced and she also had a scar on her upper right thigh and then she had a a widow's peak so these are definitely very like interesting identification markers that still I'm surprised that her family didn't like come forward um she had dark dark brown to black hair uh, shoulder length she had a wavy texture brown eyes a dark olive complexion um, they weren't actually sure what race or ethnicity she was because of how they found her. Obviously, discoloration happens when you die, so it, there's different things that can hinder a exact match on your ethnicity. They just determined they believed that she was white. Shortly after her body was found, uh, fingerprint and dental information were collected to establish her identity. Her fingerprints were added to the database, but obviously nothing was, nothing came about. Also, her dental chart was added that way um, because den there's a dental registry for teeth and um, they have access to this. All dentists have access to this. So they previously linked her to being in Massachusetts and New York and they there were some developments that she was possibly a teenage immigrant from Central or South America um, who lived in Jap Jamaica Plain Mass in that um, they had yet to actually um, locate any family. In 2016 they uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, um, it released the detail that she may have been using the names Jasmine or Jazzy while she was alive. Now, I, so I think they had a case of mistaken identity with this because that is nowhere near her name. Missing, there were, there's been many missing women across the United States and they eliminated as many as they could with her. And that they offered a cash reward of $2,000 for her case if they had any information. And the case that they, there's another case that they thought that she was. And that is the case of Maria Ingeris. And she ran away from her Connecticut home in 1976. So they thought that it was her, but it was Her face has been reconstructed so many times and released to the public. Uh, there's three versions that exist that were rendered by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And there's some other sketches that exist of her. When there's cases like these, they like to do updated and age rendered matching for these sketches. So as time progresses, they'll do an age, like an age rendering of sketches for people. And what they did was, is they did one that progressed younger than what they um, projected her age was and one older. Um, that way there's two different, two other versions of just the one that they have. It is also noted that her keys had a specific imprint on it and they were made in Fitchbick, Fitchbick. How did I say it? Fitchburg, <laughs> Fitchburg, Massachusetts, and it had the letters DB and then number 09212 stamped into it. So she had connections to Massachusetts. So the grass seed bag was manufactured in Buffalo, New York, but it was only sold in the cities of Waltham, Rochdale, Lowell, South Weymouth, and Greenfield, Mass. So this bag, these grass seeds were only known in certain areas. In years before the murder, production halted on these grass seed bags. So it was somebody who had it and has had it for a while. There was 
forensics done on pollen found on her body that showed that she spent time in areas that were populous such as Boston and New York and these were detected because of um, cedar and hemlock pollen and they believe that these either originated from the New York Botanical Garden or the Harvard Gardens. This case has also been featured on America's Most Wanted and um, leads have been processed but they didn't lead to the victim's identity and that of her killers or killer. There was a break in the case in December 2015 where there was a suitable match being described as either Puerto Rican or Colombian teenager that moved to Boston with her parents and as many as five siblings and the explanation of the tattoo JP on her arm could have been for the initials of Jamaica Plain where the possible match lived on Forbes Street and potential school locations were um, included as well with this discovery but the department had difficulties finding relatives for this girl and they put that investigation on hold. And on her 40th anniversary of discovery, the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children released an updated reconstruction of the victim. This case, I... Now obviously, there's a lot of cases that don't get solved for years. And I believe I believe that if they looked more into cases that involved a similar looking female or ones that reported missing like years prior, this would have saved them a lot of time and yeah, a lot of time from leads that didn't pan out basically. So September 15th, 2021. After further DNA testing, with the assistance of Bow Technologies in Othram, they identified this girl finally as 16-year-old Margaret Federoff of Alexandria, Virginia. So, she was missing since late 1975. So, this girl was probably kidnapped and held captive for almost a year before they found her body. At the time of her disappearance, she was a student at the Hayfield Secondary School and she was reported missing by her family one year before her body was found. And um, they're still actively investigating this case because they don't know who is responsible for her, her kidnapping and her, her murder. They don't know who's responsible. So it's it's cases like these that I'm happy that they finally know who she is, but it's sad to see that they don't know who was responsible. Um, but she was a she was a beautiful girl. Um, I believe personally that the tattoo on her arm is an initial or initials of her boyfriend or somebody that she was romantically involved with um, because of it being a poor craftsmanship I believe that um, it was either done with a pen like pen ink and a needle and it was done by themselves because it is possible to do it that way but that's what that's what I think truly happened to this girl. I believe that she was abducted and she was held captive, bound, beaten, and raped, and then finally killed. But, and hopefully one day we will see who, who exactly is behind her murder, but only time will tell. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you did, hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye, guys.